Welcome everybody. Now to start off with, I need your help. Um, if somebody alongside you is still talking, would you like to give them a little nudge and just suggest that they might like to stop talking? Right, so welcome everybody, particularly if you're joining us online, we're delighted that you're with us. Oh dear, <clears throat> it didn't work. <laughs> Never mind. I'll have to revert to my old habit of calling out names. Oh, that's better. All right, let's start again. Welcome everybody, particularly if you're joining us online, we're very glad that you're with us. Uh, it's wonderful to know that as brothers and sisters in Christ, when, <clears throat> wherever we are in the world, or wherever we are in Sheffield, we can worship God together. That's wonderful. We're going to start with reading from 1 Chronicles 16. So this passage is also in the Psalms, but the original version is when David um, had it in 1 Chronicles. So if you would like to stand and we'll read together. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendour and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Father, we thank you that you are a great God. You're a great creator God. You're our God. You're our Lord. You're our Saviour. And we come this morning with grateful hearts, with full of worship and praise because of who you are and because of what you've done. And Lord, be with us, we pray. Be with us through your Holy Spirit. Guide us and lead us. Draw from us the praise and worship that is due your name, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Eric. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep love. We're going to sing that verse again. What gift?
I'd like to sit down. <clears throat> you know, one of the great privileges, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. <clears> one of the great privileges of leading a service like this is being able to look out and see people worshipping. It never ceases to move me and to touch me. As I see people singing, God, you're so good, and I see the expressions on their face and the reality of what that means to them. There's nothing more special than seeing God's people worshipping. And, uh, you know, that song said, well, one of the verses, I didn't know it, by the way, I don't know whether any of you knew it, I've never sung it before. Um, <clears throat> but one of the verses talked about that even when things are difficult, that compared to the gift of God, of Jesus at Calvary, our difficulties are nothing. And there's a song that's been on my mind this morning, actually, by um, Godfrey Bertel, uh, that talks about the fact that no matter what happens, he is still God. Yes. He's still God. And he's still our Saviour, and yeah. he's still our Lord. Right, <clears throat> a few notices. Uh, welcome visitors. If you're a visitor here this morning, um, we're really pleased you're with us. Sus, I'm delighted to see you, mate. Good to see you. Glad you're here. I don't know whether anybody else is a visitor, but if you do, if you are, you're equally welcome. And if you're the first time online, we're very, very glad that you're with us. Um, <clears throat> we have a visitor pack, and I'm told that we now have some more printed. So if you're a visitor and you want to know more about MCF, then these packs should be in the foyer. That's good. Um, <clears throat> there's no 4 p.m. service today. And in fact, there's nothing else going on at, M at uh, Unit 3 this week apart from Holiday Club. So um, <clears throat> everything else is cancelled apart from Holiday Club at Unit 3. I'm not saying things at Unit 2 or in houses are cancelled, but things at Unit 3, everything's Holiday Club. Um, <clears throat> 7 o'clock this evening, there's a prayer meeting. It's going to be led by Andy. Is it a meeting or a walk, Andy? Uh, we'll right. <clears throat> We will see whether it's a meeting or a walk, but 7 o'clock at Unit 2, there will be something involving prayer led by Andy. Um, Jill. Oh, thank you, wife. Oh, she's such a, such a wonderful wife. 
<clears throat> Thank you for that, my dear. Jill. Uh, good morning, everyone. Is this on? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Holiday Club is tomorrow. Yay! Um, so, uh, just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone that has done some cutting out already for me. I know loads of people have been uh, hard at work already, um, and, and that is only just the beginning. So, um, we are almost full. Um, in fact, one day we are full. Uh, two days we're full, more or less. Um, so, it's absolutely great that we've got so many. So, there's a, a few vacancies, um, but, uh, but yeah. Um, a few things. One is um, we're having a barbecue on the Friday of the Holiday Club, the Friday evening, and we'd love it if you can join us just to see what we have done, um, but not just to show off what we've done, because actually um, what we do is the children come back in the evening and um, we have prizes and we do songs and, all, and, and some stuff, but actually the parents get to come as well. And so what would be really good if you guys can come and talk to them and get to know them and just be church out there on the precinct whilst having a burger. Um, so if you do want to come, you're really welcome. Um, there are some um, clipboards down at the front. There's several. So there's one if you want to come, um, if you can tell us um, how many of you there will be. Um, we'd love people, if possible, to bake some cakes for us. Um, so there's a list for cakes um, there. And the other thing is kitchen help, I think. Is that right? Where's Steve? I've, wait, kitchen help yeah it, so we could do with a couple of people in the kitchen just to help um, on that night as well so if you could do that that would be great thank you what else have I got um Steve has sent something around yesterday about praying for us and um um Erica's song was it yet not Christ, not, not I, but Christ in me? And this is not about us doing this. We want God to really work in these kids and really change their lives. And given what has happened um, uh, sort of this weekend, if you like, it's, it's just so, so important. It's so important. These, these kids' lives on this estate are, are challenging um, the least. And uh, for some, it's really difficult. Um, and it's just really important to get some foundations in there and to tell them and, and tell them about the good news of, of Jesus. So, um, so yeah, sorry, I'm not going to cry. Um, so, but, but actually, so I'd really like you to pray. Steve has put that thing out there. If you are a member of the team, um, and I don't care whether that's in the kitchen or doing registration or actually whether it's in the building itself, please can you stand up? So everybody else that is sat down, if you could take a good look um, at, at all these good people, they need your prayers, particularly on Wednesday morning. <laughs> um, but actually, guys, if you could just, you know, pick a couple um, and pray for, for them throughout the week, pray for them because they are the Bible that the children will read. Yeah. They are the ones that are going to be showing God's love to these kids. And these are going to be the ones that are helping these kids with their challenges and, and so on and so forth. You can sit down there, guys. Thank you very much. Um, are there any children? We haven't got very many children here today. But are there any children here today that are coming to Holiday Club? Can you stand on your chair? It might just be Nathaniel. In which case, the whole church is going to pray for you. Um, <laughs> Okay, we've got Theo and Kai and Zach and Nathaniel and Zoe and Sophia. So, okay, there's not quite so many of them. There should be a few more. Oh, uh, and, and uh, blessing. Um, pray for the children, um, actually, because this is, you know, it's only one step. It's only one week, but actually God can change lives in that one week. So that would be really good if you could do that, please. Um, and I think the last thing I need to say is actually um, after the service, we will be setting up so there will be a bit of moving of stuff around. So please be careful with your coffees. And we will try and be careful as well. But just a warning. Thank you. Uh, Erica. How many, How many children is that? When you say you're full, how many children? Ooh. Ooh. 
<laughs> 60 and a bit. Yes. Pray for us. <laughs> it's great. Um, just to let you know, uh, an advance notice. So on the 15th of October this year, we have a, a ladies' conference. Now, I know some of you might start groaning and thinking, oh, ladies' conferences and whatever. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. Um, oh, thank you. Pete, this is great. Um, yeah, all day on the um, 15th of October, 9.30 to 4.30. Um, I'm selling tickets online, but also in paper copy version, £10. A ticket. It will be the, for the whole day, all the refreshments, lunch, and everything else. We're expecting this lovely lady to come and join us. Have any of you heard of Steve Legg, the escapologist? And so this is this is Becca, his wife. Lovely lady. has got a whole story. Her story is a story of grace, and she's going to come and share that and God's word with us on the 15th of October. So please come and see me for a ticket. It'd be great if you could invite friends, family. It'd be really great if you could go on Facebook and invite a whole load of people as well. We have a vision um, to fill this building. Steve says 80 is a good number. I was thinking like 120. <laughs> Steve's laughing nervously at the front. But I mean, so far tickets are going. But yeah, please invite friends. If £10 is, you're thinking, actually, I'd love to come, but that is just... Uh, not something I can budget, then please come and see me and we can make an arrangement. No problem. We'd rather have people here enjoying the day. So thank you very much. Leave it on. Right. And uh, <clears throat> the church would like to have a baptism in September. So if you haven't been baptised and you would like to be, or if you wouldn't like to be, but you know God wants you to be, which he does, then Nick is the person to see. And Jonathan usually says that as you go under the water, we haven't lost anybody yet. I don't think Pam's here. We nearly lost Pam, but not quite. That's right, isn't it, Rob? We didn't lose her. No, she's still around. So baptism... In September, if you haven't been baptised, see Nick. All right. And being very serious for a moment, um, some of you may not know what Jill was referring to about the events over the weekend, but there's, what, there's been what looks like a murder in Bowshaw Close, just over in Batemore. And uh, three children in that family, and uh, at least two of them, was it two or was it all three of them, have, came, have been in Holiday Club? All three of those children have been in Holiday Club. The family have an association with the library as well. Um, so we will be praying for that, into, into that situation later. There will be a chance for open prayer because we think this is such an important topic. We're going to make time for that this morning, no matter what. But that's what Jill was referring to. Right, um, it's time for the, um, the family item, and we've got one of the most famous... Um, Greaves Family Lego Movies. One day Jesus was being questioned. What shall I do to gain eternal life? The scriptures say, Love God with all your heart, all your mind and all your strength, and love other people too. How can we love other people? So Jesus told them a story to help them understand. A man was walking down the road when suddenly bad guys they attacked and left him for dead. Along came a man, he was a priest. He didn't want to get his hands dirty, so off he went. Then along came a Levite, but he won't help either. He cared more about his own safety. Along came a Samaritan man. 
He wasn't even one of God's people, but he felt sorry for the man. So he cleaned up his wounds, put them on his donkey and carried him away. He found someone to take care of him. He paid him to take care of him. When Jesus finished telling the story, he asked them, which one of these men showed love to the wounded man? The one who helped him, I suppose. Then go and be like, be like him, Jesus said. Right, we've now got a video from Olivia Butters. Olivia's out away on holiday this week, although she is home from uh, the various places she's been. But uh, she's done a video to tell us about what she's up to. So if we can have that video, that would be great. Um, good morning. Um, some of you may have seen me during the last couple of Sundays. Honestly, it's been so nice to be home and not feel instantly cold. Uh, unfortunately, I'm away for the next um, two Sundays, and so Jonathan asked me to just share with you a quick update on the past six months and my plans looking ahead to the coming period. As many of you will know, I've just returned home from Yemen, where I was working with an organisation called MSF, working in a health structure in the southern part of the country. Since the outbreak of the war, um, the health system in Yemen has largely collapsed, with health facilities destroyed during the fighting, public infrastructure, um, electricity, water, waste management have also collapsed. And so MSF, we were working in a city called Tice, um, have been supporting the maternity wing of a hospital there. And you may have seen from my newsletters that the purpose of my visit was to install an incinerator to burn medical waste and expired drugs that had accumulated since the start of the war, which has been going on since May 2015. This took longer than planned. But hopefully there should also be a, um, a picture of the working incinerator and, and much to my surprise it was working really smoothly when I left. Uh, for those of you who are thinking what's, what's the big deal, um, this incinerator can reach temperatures of up to 1200 degrees and completely destroys the waste and purifies any smoke generated. So it's a really, really impressive piece of equipment and I enjoyed trying to work out how it works. Um, and for me, it wasn't just about the installation, also how it operates, training the team. Um, so in the same way that you wouldn't cook a roast chicken at the same time and temperature you'd cook a cake. And there is a real science to operating these machines. And so I learned a lot during the last six months. And it was really brilliant working alongside the national staff, watching their understanding deepen. And um, yeah, I was really, really sad, sad to leave, um, but excited for this new chapter in my life. Um, as I'll start off by saying, I'm absolutely loving being back home in the UK, catching up with family and um, friends. And as I was reflecting on my last two and a half years of working with MSF, it's been absolutely incredible. But one of the things I've really missed is regular fellowship, being part of church family. And so around February, March, I began to pray um, over what, what comes up next. And various options cropped up. Um, but yeah, being able to attend a church regularly was something I knew I needed to prioritise, at least for the next period. Um, and to take this opportunity just to rest, um, invest in friendships, seeing, seeing more of my family, my elderly grandma. And what was amazing is that as I prayed over this, um, I began to apply for opportunities. God's hand was very, very evident in timings, in contacts, and how everything kind of fell into place. So as of mid-August, I'm going to be heading up to Newcastle. Um, some of you may remember I went to university up there. Um, and I'm going to be working with my old lecturer at the university as a research assistant, looking at climate change and water in the urban environment. So very, very relevant to what I'm doing and um, should be really useful as I look at kind of continuing in the development aid world. Um, so don't get me wrong, this is by no means the end of my international traveling and working and you'll most definitely see me back about to head off somewhere new. But I am really excited to be in England. The position is for about eight months. Um, and so I'm very glad to be here for this period and just to see how God will continue working in my life. Um, I only arrived back in England two weeks ago. And so many of the logistics of moving again 
um, so quickly are still to be determined. So I'd really value prayer that those logistical needs will fall into place, accommodation, sorting out my house in Sheffield, etc. So that would be brilliant. And just a huge prayer of thanks that the past six months have been really, really fruitful. Um, I'll be around at the beginning of August. And so I hope to catch up with many of you then. Um, good morning. Um, Right, in just a moment, we'll show the how to give um, uh, um, offering video. Um, so if you're watching online and you want to give, then this will tell you how you can do so. The most important thing is that you're with us, but if you want to give, you can. Um, and in the building, there will be bags passed around um, to enable you to give. Um, and once the offering's been received, the, uh, the children and youth will leave. So if we can have the, um, the how to give um, video, that would be great. song today um, I think the title of the song says it all a thousand hallelujahs and um, just listen to the words join in sing with us worship God I think it's one of the songs when you can't find the words to describe what God means to you what he's done for you and you play this song you go yeah that's what I want to say so um, I hope you're blessed this morning Cry out to worship Whose glory taught the stars to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing But this joy is mine We'll sing that again
Jesus. This song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Hallelujah. How great. Worship the Lord where you are. You are worthy of praise. Tell him your own words. And my heart will sing how great is our God. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You alone deserve the praise, the honor, and adoration, Lord. This morning, we declare, O oh Lord, and my God, that your name is above every name, every disease, every illness. Oh, Father God, we lift your name high this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord.
are never tired of praising your name, Lord. We'll praise your name again and again and again because you are worthy of the praise. We've searched all around, we'll look and we've not found anyone like you, Lord. What a mighty God you are. What a Savior, Redeemer, and a friend you are. We bless your name this morning, O oh Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your voice and tell the Lord in your own words how great he's been in your life. How much he showed his love for you. We bless your name, Lord. You are God.
Aleluya. Lord Jesus, we come this morning, we declare that you are alive and that you have won the victory and that you are worthy of our praise. You're worthy of us singing hallelujah. And Lord, we believe that as we sing your praises and as we shout your name, we believe it radiates to the area around here that is so need, it's so much in need of your love and so much in need of your salvation. And Lord, even now, we pray that you will fall upon this area with your glory. Lord, save souls, redeem souls, we pray, because you are worthy of all our praise. You are alive. Lord, what a victory cry that we can shout, Jesus, you're alive, you're risen from the dead. And as we've already sung, one day we will spend eternity in praise and worship. And Lord, this is good, but it will be much better. And we thank you. Amen. Lawrence. Thanks, brother. I hope it's on, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll just check. Can, can you hear me? Thank you, technology. <laughs> God, praise God. Praise the Lord. I just want to share for a few minutes this morning about an amazing conversation that meant a lot to me. You can hear me okay, can you? Thanks. Outside the Royal Hallamshire Hospital, where I was back in the spring. If you remember, I did share just before um, about the 40 Days for Life event there, um, which is just an attempt to help and bring healing actually there. And I'm also shortly going to give you an invitation to every single person here and every person who isn't here but who belongs to church as well, down in London, coming to it shortly. Initially, though, back to the conversation. So I was there outside the hospital. Elaine stood with me, sometimes bless her. She wasn't there on this time. But when she was and when she wasn't, I both times felt God helping me there, though it wasn't always easy. Sometimes, once misunderstood, it comes with the job. Right, back to this conversation. It's my third vigil. Got there about 10 o'clock. About 20 past 10, six... came up. They sort of surrounded me and firing questions at me, left, right and centre. I had my work cut out. This went on for about 40 minutes. Okay? And they weren't unduly unpleasant. It was reasonably respectful, firing questions at me why I was taking a pro-life stand there. Then four left at about 10 past 11. By that time, my colleague had joined me for the 11 o'clock stint, but I hadn't recognized him, hadn't met him before, so I was carrying on with these six. As I say, they left at about 10 past 11. Two remained. Four left, two remained. And they said to me, straight away, actually, we agreed with you, but we couldn't say so in the presence of our friends. The conversation developed, and it got very friendly and good. They said to me, there's many topics now, say, uh, they said, on which we cannot depart from an accepted line. I asked for examples. They gave them. Don't have time to go into them. A very friendly conversation developed. It got better and better as time went on. Then a car pulled up at the traffic lights. Down comes the window. Usual thing. You've got no right to be here. And humanly speaking, I can understand that. I mean, I don't, unless God places me there. One of these two lads, before I could say a thing, walked across to the car. Actually, he said, we're having a civilized conversation here to the lady. And I can't remember exactly what else was said. Maybe she would some, said something else, I can't quite remember. Window went up again, she had to drive off, the traffic lights had changed. It's one advantage of being there, by the way, but because there are traffic lights, nobody can give you too much trouble before the traffic lights change, and they have to go. 
In fact, I've known occasions when everybody starts parping their horn behind because somebody's giving me a bit of difficulty from the car, but then they have to go. The traffic lights change. Okay. <clears throat> then they continue to stay. And it got so good, I said, look, I'm a Christian. Can I pray with you, please? They said, yes. I prayed with them there on the pavement outside the hospital. I'm not saying they got converted, but they were respectful and they listened to my prayer. One of them was called... I'm not sure. But I was greatly blessed. I happened to see one of them the following week and we had another good conversation. I want to give my invitation to you now. You're all invited down to London, okay? On September the 3rd, there's a march for life. Why do I go down there and why do I join? Because I feel, as the thousands of us march through the centre of London, that we're celebrating the inherent value of human life, which actually, if you look at the politics, is so often at risk. I know there's complex issues I can't go into, but that's basically what we celebrate. So we walk, we sing, some walk in silence. We have opponents, that's okay. That's all part of it. But as we go, this is what I feel, that we are seeking to bring healing to the nation. Healing for hurt. We're not there to judge. We are there to help and heal and offer an alternative. After all, people often talk about choice. Okay, we offer a choice. And that's why I was there for 40 Days for Life outside the hospital in Lent. Just want to share those things with you. Thank you for hearing me. I think there's some flyers out there. I've got one here. It's September the 3rd. We meet. Uh, the march starts at 2 o'clock outside the Emmanuel Centre in central London. I have the address just through there or here. But the events start much earlier, about 10.30 or 11 at the Emmanuel Centre. Then there are speeches when the march ends at 4 o'clock in Parliament Square. And we hear many, many things and moving stories. Thank you so much. God bless you. Let's pray with Nick before he speaks to us. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you are a God who encompasses everything that there is in our lives. We thank you that you're a creator God. And we thank you that through everything, you love us and you care for us. Lord, we do bring Nick to you now as he speaks to us, as he brings your word. We pray, Lord, that you will bless him we pray that you will empower him through your Holy Spirit, uh, <clears throat> Lord, and that you will give us the ears to listen to what you're saying to each of us individually. Lord, we believe that as Nick speaks, that you speak to each of us too. And we really pray now that we may know your presence and your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. good morning. It's so good to see everybody. We've been away on holiday. Some of you may have been, some of you are going, some of you might not be going, who knows, but uh, it's good to be back and good to be among you all. And I uh, get to continue with the Romans uh, theme. We're going through it like an express train. Um, we're on Romans chapter 13 now. So if you've got your Bibles or your little books, notebooks and pens, please look up Romans 13. Chris, I understand, did the last one, submission to governing authorities. So I'm on verse, uh, verse 8 through to 14. And I'm going to read it to you. So I think it's going to come up on the screen. I mentioned uh, to Sam that it's the NIV, but there's so many versions of the NIV now. Um, it used to be the nearly infallible version, but there's so many, uh, so many versions. But we're going to read, I'm going to read from my Bible and then uh, uh, follow on the screen or in your own Bible if you can. Romans 13 verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time, 
The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Amen. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. There are certain passages in Romans, aren't there, that are a little, take a little bit of getting your head around. Very uh, complicated and uh, uh, tough concepts to grasp. But I'm thankful that this passage is fairly straightforward, fairly open. And um, somebody uh, once said to me, you know, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that's the problem. It's the parts I do understand that give me the problem. Because there's an awful lot of challenge in a very simple passage. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves has fulfilled the law. Simple. (laughs) Easy, isn't it, Christianity? Love gets a bit of a bad press. There are a few human experiences and concepts that are more badly misunderstood than love. And I think we're... We're set up to misunderstand maybe the impact of Paul's words here simply because our minds have so many preconceived ideas about what love is all about. What's love got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? What's love but a sweet old-fashioned notion? Howard knows. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but there's all the songs are about love, aren't they? All the concept of t- TV programs are, are, are about love. Love is all around us. We feel it in our fingers. We feel it in our toes. But how rarely is love thought of beyond the impact on us, beyond the way we feel, beyond the good things that it does for us. To say we love someone is usually a reflection of the positive feelings we have towards that person or the positive feelings they give us about ourselves. Oh, that's great. We we love that person. We love love. But if circumstances change, if behaviors change, if offense is felt, if there's pain in in the equation, then our understanding of love can be weak It can be transitory. It can leave quickly. It can leave as quickly as it can. We talk about falling in love. We can fall out of love. We can become bitter. We can become angry. And we can become hateful. Because love seems to evaporate relatively quickly when things go wrong. But the biblical understanding of love is something so much. Your love can be a word that can be a little bit. In our understanding, it can be a little bit insipid. It's a bit like nice. You know, somebody's very nice. You think, oh, we're always told by our English teacher, don't use words like nice. You have to uh, use, now it's, it's sort of regained a bit of uh, uh, positivity now being nice. But you say, no, don't use nice. It's too, it's too weak. It's too colorless. So think of some other words. And love can be a little bit uh, like that. You know, it becomes devalued because of the, the, the way that it's used so widely and so freely. But Song of Songs 8, 7 in the Bible says, many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. That quality of love, rock solid, unmovable, unchanging, fierce, committed, enduring love is very rare in real life experience. And yet, it is the nature of the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And in that phrase is loaded so much cost, so much pain, so much commitment, so much sacrifice that God so loved the world, therefore he gave his only son. God's love leads to a a tremendous amount of consequence and impact in our lives. Love is powerful. It's an inescapable commitment that is more certain than anything. And our hearts can be stirred by that concept, but we think, can it really be 
true. That it's a locked in, non-negotiable, non-cancellable covenant promise that you can build your life on without fear. That's the nature of love. Like Tina Turner, is it Tina Turner? What's love got to do with it? Yeah. See, I don't know about popular culture, Howard. But um, thank you very much. <laughs> What's love got to do? You know, it's, it's just, there's that, that sort of nervousness, that insecurity, that, that fear that surrounds love when it comes to human expression of love. But the, God, the love that God has and the love that God calls us to and the lot, God that, love that God wants us to experience is so much more. That is the quality of love we are to have for God and for each other. Love that costs us. Love that is inconvenient. Love that is painful. Love that challenges what we are used to. Paul says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Let no debt remain outstanding except the debt to love one another. If I am in debt, that colors my life my decisions, my priorities, it's what I think about. I work in order to pay that debt. I can't get up one morning and think, well, I'm not going to bother doing anything about my debts today. I don't feel like it. It doesn't suit me today, this week, this month. Mortgage can hang. It doesn't matter. We're just going to enjoy ourselves. Only lasts for a little while, doesn't it, until there's a knock on the door. Because we have a legal and a moral obligation to pay our debts. That's what, that's, that, that's what life is often all about. It has nothing to do with what I think or what I feel. It's, not, it's nothing to do with what's inside of me at all. It's an external obligation. I can tell the bank that I don't feel like paying, but they're just going to hand me the piece of paper. So it's your responsibility. It's your debt. You have to pay. So let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. And so we need to look at our responsibility to love in the same way that we look on our financial debts. That's how we understand our responsibility. There is a continuing debt of love that must be paid. Our problem is we get everything turned on its head and we imagine that it is we who are owed. When it comes to love, the world owes me. You owe me. Why don't you love me? It's your responsibility to love me, to make me feel good, to make me feel secure, to nod and say amen when I'm preaching. It's, it's responsible. <laughs> Didn't get the hint, did you? <laughs> we are not the creditor when it comes to love. We are the debtor. And our calculation needs to always be, how can I meet my obligations to love in this circumstance, in this relationship, in my life? I have an obligation to work it out from my point of view, how to be the one who loves, how to be the one who pays that debt, how to be the one who takes that responsibility. Rather than calling in all my debts all the time, you didn't love me enough, you don't care for me enough, you didn't smile at me enough, you, weren't, you, know, you didn't pay enough attention to me. You, you have a debt with me. No, that's not, that's not how the Bible understands it. We have a continuing debt that, cut, that we need to pay, that we need to love one another with. And in one way or the other, I guess, if we go, if we go into all the stories, we would all have experience of the negative side of relationships. We are all vulnerable to the pain of broken relationships or challenge in relationships. And the question is, how do we respond when things go bad? How do we respond when things don't work out the way we hoped and planned? And this is one of the things that has gone round and round my mind over many years because I also, we also are, are, are vulnerable to that, have experienced that, have experienced difficulty and challenge and pain when it comes to human relationships. What does forgiveness look like? How do I love someone who has hated me. It's all very well, you know, understanding the, the concept that we need to forgive 70 times 7. But what does it actually mean to forgive someone in real life when there's real pain, when there's real hurt, when there's real difficulty and challenge and, and misunderstanding? How do we 
get around that and live a life that is honouring to the word of God and honouring to God's requirements on us to pay our debt of love. Because the easiest thing to do is to follow the path of least resistance. To follow the way of all flesh and just let your negative emotions roar. And you know what will happen is everybody understands. Nobody will blame you. You will always find someone to back you up in the negative. If you, want to, if you go around and you tell somebody, have you heard what so-and-so has done? Have you heard what they said? Have you heard how they've behaved? Really? And then it just gets into a, and it just starts becoming a big pile on. And everybody's, you know, and then you think, well, you know, and I'm not going to talk to that person anymore, and I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do that. And you've got all of, the, all of the reinforcement because that's where we feel comfortable because that's the way our flesh leads us. That's the way our hearts go sometimes into the negative and into the destructive. And those cycles can last for many, many years. And the challenge for us as Christians is to realize that even though we've been hurt, and even though a withdrawal has been made, from our lives, we actually are still the debtors that our responsibility is to continue to love and to work out what it means to continually pay that debt of love. Because we have, if we can't love in the good times and the bad, then we're missing the mark when it comes to understanding the heart of God. You ever wonder why Jesus talked about loving your enemies? Because loving people who aren't your enemies is quite easy. Loving your enemies is the challenge. There's been a quote going around on Facebook. I don't know if you've seen it, but but I've never heard it put that way before, but it really challenged me. It said that the challenge of Christianity is not loving Jesus, it's loving Judas. You have to think about that for a while. We also, you know, we love Jesus. Yeah, but do you love Judas? And this is the challenge of Christian love. Love that doesn't, can't wipe away everything that is done, everything that is said, everything that happens, can't forget all of those things, but yet somehow finds a way to bridge the divide, to pay the debt, to cross the barrier. There are many different circumstances and relationships where I've had to think through what all this means, because I certainly, I mean, no way, I would never say, oh, you know, I've got this nailed. I understand this because it is so difficult and we need to wrestle with it and try to understand how our continuing debt to love shapes our lives and our decisions and our our priorities, how it shapes how we deal with people and how we deal with challenges in relationships. But the fundamental truth is that we don't have the freedom to walk away. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Remember somebody describing covenant once, saying that covenant means we abandon the right to quit. And however hard it is, however difficult it is, however challenging it is, we simply don't have the option to turn our back and walk away and say, well, that's it, that's finished. We, we, walk, we have to, to work out, by the grace of God, what it means to continue to pay a debt of love. And that will actually, there is, we need to continually look for the things that separate us from, 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 the, from the way of all the world. And one of the benefits of going through the book of Romans is that it has laid the foundations for our understanding of what makes the church different. What makes us different from every other well-meaning, socially positive group in the entire world. And it's all to do with this gospel and the response that we make to it within our hearts and how it actually starts to work out in our experience and in our relationships with each other. It goes on in verse 11. My eyes have suddenly got... I used to be... I never knew whether to put these glasses on or off, but now I can't see anything. I need healing. Verse 11. And do this... Understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Do this. Pay this debt. Live like this. Understanding the present time. You know, when we just, as I've said, follow the way of all flesh, it's because we don't have that that vision of eternity. We've been singing about eternity this morning. We don't have that that vision we think about, what is happening to me immediately now, how I feel now, and how I'm going to respond now. But we need to live our lives with a a view and with a vision that, uh, that understands the present time that we are in because the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. 
So Paul contrasts this instruction to pay our debt of love and he contrasts it with living in a way that is just is what he calls the deeds of darkness, carousing. That's, an, uh, that's probably one word that our English teacher would have got us to look up. Carousing, drunkenness, sexual immorality and debauchery, dissension and jealousy. Just living however you want to live, however you, you feel, just, just, just fulfilling your own needs and desires and, and that. Or live in this way thinking about what it means to be a disciple of Christ, thinking about what it means to honor God, thinking about what it means to reflect our faith in the way that we act and the way that we speak and the way that we deal with everybody around us. The ordered, disciplined life of faith against the existence that just follows every idea and feeling wherever it comes from. So our decision to follow Christ is a decision that we make on one day in our lives. I can remember... Uh, I don't remember the exact day, but it was back in about 1987. I made a decision to follow Christ. Somebody put on the, on the prayer thing recently. It was 38 years since they surrendered their life to Christ. We, we have an idea of when it was that we, we had that moment. Maybe yours was much nearer than that. But we have to make that decision every day of our lives to consider his call upon us, our duty to respond, because what he calls us to is worth everything it might seem to cost us. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Whenever it was you first believed, your salvation is nearer now. And so we need to be shaping our lives and prioritizing our lives and and seeing that work of transformation by grace working in our lives, preparing us for that salvation that is nearer now than it was when we first believed. The day is nearly here. The world that we live in appeals to our flesh in every way imaginable, whether in the way we think and act or in the way we relate to people around us. But Christians are different because we've understood that not everything is about what we feel, not everything is about what we want, but it's about, you know, these things are not the purpose of the universe, but we have a higher calling and a higher purpose to live in a way that pleases God. We're not talking about a dry code of law here. We're talking about the grace of God that Romans has been all about. And and elsewhere in the scripture says the grace of God teaches us, teaches us how to live, teaches us to say no to unrighteousness, teaches us what is in the heart of God. And we need to be those that are continually seeing growth in the way we understand what it is to be a Christian. God is working his purposes out. Graham mentioned earlier the song that says he's still God. Well, I've never known a time that has been more chaotic politically, socially, scientifically, whatever. Everything is, is, as seems to have just gone into, into the tumble dryer. Everything seems to be breaking down. Every radio or TV station, I had to turn it off the other day. They were just going on and on about everything that was going to happen to me and how my life was ending. And, um <laughs> They were telling me I was going to boil to death in the heat wave and then I'm going to freeze to death because I can't afford to eat in the winter. And it it was just like one thing after another. Pandemic, climate catastrophe, cost of living, it's all Armageddon. In fact, one of the BBC people apparently said this week, this is what Armageddon looks like. But well, he's he's setting his standards low probably. (laughs) But what do you think about What do you feel when you look forward to the weeks and months ahead? They keep telling us winter's coming. We don't know what winter's bringing with it. But there's a challenge for us. You know, we can laugh about it, but again, it can be a real thing. There's so much, Graham mentioned, all that's happening on on the estate over this weekend, and it brings with it a climate of fear and uncertainty and a shaking of our hope because we don't know what on earth is happening to our world. Is your hope shaken? Do you feel afraid? Maybe there are specific things in your own life that are weighing you down and you, you, know, you wake up in the morning and suddenly you think, oh no, this is what I'm carrying through life. There is an uncertainty and a, and a hopelessness and a fear that might come in. We might not be getting lost in carousing and drunkenness or whatever, but we are overwhelmed and our faith becomes dim. And what he says is, Clothe yourself with Christ. 
Someone who clothes themselves with Christ begins to look like him, sound like him, think like him. Our clothing is about our appearance. It's much more than just our, what goes on in the privacy of our own heart or our own mind. It's about what we wear on the outside for everybody to see. That's why people take time over their clothing. They want to consider how they appear, how they look, because it portrays something about us. It's how we want the world to see us. It's about how we live. It's about our presence in it. And so in times of great uncertainty, instead of clothing ourselves with fear, clothing ourselves with hopelessness, clothing ourselves with negative speak, clothing ourselves with all the negative emotions that come, we need to practice the art of clothing ourselves with Christ, clothing ourselves with faith, clothing ourselves with the understanding that he's still God. He's still on the throne. He's still moving in power. He still has purposes. He still has a future. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That he would give them a warning, you're going to enter seven years of famine in the old days. But, but in the middle of that, he was able to bless. He was able to establish. He was able to strengthen. And we need to clothe ourselves with the clothes of faith. This is our opportunity. So we approach the challenges of life not listening to the loud voices all around us that know nothing of God or nothing of eternity. I think that's what I've noticed more as more more and more negative stuff. News is always negative, isn't it? But it just seems to be relentless. You know, even not even news. Now thinking about what what could happen. One one piece of breaking news the other day was that snake bites are increasing in the UK. It's It's not it's not that's not news. I suppose it's news if you get bitten by a snake. But they, you know, there's, there's this, this, this constant negative, but there's an utter hopelessness. People, they present the fear, present the negative, but have nothing to add, nothing to help, nothing to build, nothing to strengthen. This is what is happening, but... And that's where the church is different. That's where as we clothe ourselves with Christ and we walk in in the streets and we walk amongst our friends and we walk amongst our family, people that are surrounded with a heavy cloud of fear and uncertainty and anxiety and not knowing what's going to happen next. And we can go into those situations clothed with Christ, not just with the words that we speak, but with all that we are, all that we present, the attitude, the demeanor, the, the, the way that we walk, the way that we think, the way that we look forward. With, like the Bible said about Abraham, you know, facing the fact that his body was as good as dead, but against all hope and hope belief, we face the facts. We know we live in a world that is falling apart. We know we live in a world that is beset by cost of living crisis. We know there is, there is disease around. We know there are all of these things, but yet we have the opportunity to clothe ourselves with Christ and present something different, to say, yes, it's real. Yes, it's, it's happening, but there is hope, but there is, there is vision, but there is a future. That's the message that we have. This is the thing, you know, in a, in, what does it mean to, to families that are surrounded where there, is, where there is violence and where there's death and where there's, 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 there's sadness and destruction and grief and all of that, and there's nothing, to, to, nothing to, to counteract that. We are those who are clothed with Christ. and We have the compassion and the mercy and the joy that there can be joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I, Paul says, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Don't just rejoice when when the pay packet comes in. Rejoice when it doesn't come in. Though the fig tree doesn't blossom and there be no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in my God. This is what it means to be clothed with Christ. It's not being pretending. It's not being fake. It's just being... It's being real with our faith. Say that, that, that he is real and he, we have a hope. The, the night is almost over. The day is almost here. We're surrounded by very real challenges, like war and all of that brings. And yet the night is almost over. The day is almost here. That's our message. That's what we carry with us. We don't, you know, the, we're all gonna, we're all gonna die in a, in a nuclear Armageddon or whatever, you know, all these negative things that come up. No, God is still God. God is on the throne. He is working his purposes out and there is nothing, as my friend Jeff Mullenger in Zambia says, there is nothing that takes him by accident. Clothe yourself with Christ. See every fearful prediction as an opportunity to grow in our faith and knowledge of Christ. And don't be tempted. 
to discard him in the turmoil of all that goes on. Every turbulent and unstable period of history is an opportunity to put down roots into God. Are you worried about your circumstances? It's an opportunity to trust God. It's an opportunity to discover grace. It's an opportunity to clothe yourself with Christ in the face of great challenge. And I'm not being glib about the reality of problems here, but I am being realistic about what it means to put our faith and our roots into Christ. If we are going to continue paying our debt of love, if we're going to rise up in the faith as the days get more challenging, then we need the resources of heaven. And we need to look to God for his resources rather than listening to ourselves. Are you ready to stand before God and ask him for all that he has? Or, are we going to, or do we feel like we're going to get pushed over by every negative thought that comes, every challenge that is around, every, every challenging person, every challenging circumstance? We can stand strong. We can stand firm. That's for each and every one. of That's the beauty of the gospel. That it doesn't, it's, not, it's not led from the platform, but it comes from our hearts. And we stand firm in all that God has called us to be, who we are in Christ. Amen. I want us to... I don't know what you want to do, Graham. Right. There's so many things that... Because uh, I want us to respond... But also I want us to, like, like Graham said, we need, to, we need to pray with a real heart of compassion into the circumstances and the situations that we're facing, even in our own neighborhood here, in our, in our own estate. And this is part of, a part of what it means to be clothed with Christ. That we meet these things with faith and an expectation of grace. That even in the midst of great tragedy... God can still be found. Because it's, it's tempting for people to always say, well, in such a circumstance, where is God? Where is God when these things happen? And yet for those who are prepared to put their roots of faith down in him, we'll find that he's right there in the middle of these circumstances. And we can see the grace of God worked out. And so I wonder if we could stand together. If you're able to stand, please do. If not, don't feel under any pressure to do that at all. And we're going to lift our hearts and our minds towards God. And first of all, we're going to come as individuals. Because I know, I could ask one or two, you know, I could ask people to respond and, and a few people would respond. But I know that this need that we have is in all of our hearts, 100% response. We need the resources of heaven in order to, to live an upright life, to live a rooted life, to live a founded life in this, in this current situation. We need to be people of faith. We need to be people of expectation of the future. We need to be people of vision. We need to be people of joy. And so we're going to pray that God would fill us with his Holy Spirit, that he would fill us with his ability. He would fill us with his resources that we need. All the, if we're going to pay a debt, we need resources to do it. And so we ask that he would fill us with the resources of heaven to pay our debt of love. And we'll ask him that he, that he will fill us with the resources that we need to clothe ourselves with him. That he would give us what is necessary in order that we can live a life that is honoring and reflective of the reality of who he is in our lives. And then as we do that, we're going to move on and we're going to pray specifically. If you don't mind, is that okay, Graham? Pray for, for Batemore and the situation. Well, we can do that. Definitely, I'll do that. Is you okay if I do that? Yeah, okay. So then we're going to pray and we're going to have an open time of prayer because, again, it's not me just to pray, but it's us. As we clothe ourselves with Christ, we're going to pray for the, for, the, for the setting that God has put us in and for the families that are most affected by this situation. So let's just lift our, our hearts and our voices towards God and let's ask him to fill us with his spirit. Jesus. Father God, we come to you this morning because we don't know, we have nowhere else to go. We know that you are the source of all that we need. Pour out this, your Holy Spirit upon us, Lord God, as we stand before you with our arms raised and outstretched. Our hearts are open. We know that we are weak. 
We know that we are un- incapable, Lord God. We're incapable of loving. We're incapable of doing all the things that you call us to do. And so we come to you with a, with a, with a desperate cry that you would pour out the resources of heaven into our lives and into our hearts, that you would fill us, oh God, with all that you have for us. Jesus, renew us, restore us, refresh us, revive us, I pray. Give us hearts, expect open hearts, hearts of faith, Lord God, hearts of reliance upon you. That know that it's only you that can give us this, Lord God. I pray for specific situations where there is relationship breakdown. Lord God, I pray that by your grace you would provide the resources, that the debt of love might be paid, and that there might be ways through. Father, I thank you that there is always a way, that you give us the way. You give us resources, Father. You give us all that we need in order to be your people. We don't want to be the way of all flesh. We don't want to be just like everybody else on the face of the earth, but we want to be those who are different, those who find the joy and the freedom and the liberation of being children of God and living accordingly. Father God, we pray, fill it, pour out your spirit upon us, oh God, I ask, in Jesus' name. And as we clothe ourselves with Christ, I pray that you would give us all that we need, that we would understand in our hearts what that means day by day, that we would be able to, in our conversation, in our our dealings with people, in in our interactions, God, that we would be able to portray something of Christ in those things, not just, not just talking about what we believe, but showing it, demonstrating it, living it, walking it, wearing Christ out and about in, these, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our colleges. Help us, Lord, we pray. Yeah. And now, Lord, we come and we pray, we lift up this uh, estate, Batemore, God, and Jordan Thorpe, we know what has, what has happened, we've heard the reports of what has happened. And Lord God, we pray. And we pray for your mercy, for your compassion, for your, for your peace, for your justice. Lord God, we pray for it to be poured out. And we pray that God, out of terrible darkness and terrible tragedy, you would move in power. We pray in Jesus' name. And just invite you just to speak out, please. As I say, as we, as we join in this together, let's have, an, let's have an open time of prayer as we pray for our, for, for our neighborhood and our community. Mm. Yes, Lord. Mm. Father, we pray about the sense of fear mm. that, uh, that is pervading that part of, of the estate. Mm. Yeah. We know that, um, <coughs> Erica has mentioned, people who are reaching the stage of being afraid to go out with um, shootings last weekend and on this, this issue this weekend. Mm. Lord, we long to see your peace mm. coming upon this place. Mm. Lord, we long to see people knowing in their hearts some of the things that Nick has been speaking about today, that that you are God. Lord, we bring this this estate to you and ask you to show mercy, to come um, in great and tender mercy Mm. uh, to the people of this estate, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Mm. Yeah. Amen. 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 Things that we, we do want to pray for. Um, Jim Beaver evidently fell out of his wheelchair. So, Lord, we bring Jim to you. And we ask for your healing touch upon him, Lord, that he hasn't been significantly or in any way injured by this fall. And for your blessing upon Jim and Sheila as they seek to move house as well. Well, we do pray about the situation in the country. We pray for the um, <clears throat> election of the next Prime Minister. We heard last week, Lord, that uh, uh, you appoint uh, governments. And we acknowledge that. And pray, Lord, for the right person for this country to be appointed. Lord, we do pray for the, um, the Holiday Club this week knowing that these uh, three children have been through Holiday Club we, uh, and are now facing such a trial and difficulty in their life, we, we recognise how crucial it is for people, young people, children, to hear of your love. So, Lord, we bring Holiday Club to you and ask for your blessing upon that time this week. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. The time's gone, really, Erica, but I do want to finish with a song. I feel we need to finish with a song, a song of praise. <clears throat> Isn't it wonderful that during the week you're going to have that phrase about being clothed with Christ ringing through your mind about every ten minutes. And every ten minutes, as that phrase comes to your mind, you're going to think about the, the way that 
You want to express the love of Jesus to people. You want him to be more of your life um, as you demonstrate to the people around you that you're a Christian. So I pray that for everybody, that phrase being clothed with Christ, with Christ, will be constantly in your thoughts this week. Amen. Erica. <clears throat>
the words of the grace up, please? Now, I want to know, are we going to say now, or aren't we going to say now? Because so far, half of the people say now, and half don't. I think we should say now in that last line, all right? Have you got it? Yeah. Right. May the grace, grace of, of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the, the love of God and the, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us all now, now and, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful week.